As the COVID epidemic continues, we're dipping into our Q&A archives. This episode, our guest is historian Jeff Gwynn on his book, The Vagabonds. It's a fascinating tale of the well-publicized summer road trips taken by Henry Ford and Thomas Edison between 1914 and 1925. They sparked car sales, the motel industry, and the American love of summer road trips. Jeff Quinn, what is the story that you tell in the book, The Vagabonds? The story I meant to tell at the beginning was how America morphed into a car culture in just about 20 years, from everyone still horse and wagon to everyone wanting to get in cars and go places. I had not known till I started researching that Henry Ford and Thomas Edison were at the forefront of this. So the book became the story of them at that point in their lives, too. How did the idea come to you for telling this particular story at this time? Well, this is my 22nd book. And what I try to do when I write my nonfiction books is to go everywhere that the people I'm writing about went. I always use my car. I'd rather drive. That way you really get a sense of place. Somewhere along the line, in the 30,000 or so miles I drive every year, I started wondering how we got to be a country, a culture, where we take for granted we're going to get in a car, we can go anywhere we want to. Since I didn't know, I thought it would be a good idea to write a book about that. And as always happens when you look into history, there's a lot more to it than you ever expected. Your book begins and ends with a, a, someone that's a minor character in the book by the name of Jeb Bisbee. We're going to show his picture on screen here. Who was he and why was he interesting to you? One of the things that struck me as I researched the book was how the vagabonds, Ford, Edison, whatever friends might be with them on that trip, could literally change the lives of anyone they met. They were considered magicians for all the things that brought to our culture, and people expected they could work miracles. Sometimes they did. Jeff Bisbee was an elderly country fiddler working out of Paris, Michigan, playing barn dances and so forth. And that was pretty much the height of his musical career. He was listed in local archives as a shoemaker. Henry Ford had heard about Jep's music, and unexpectedly, in 1923, Jep Bisbee's wife opens their door in this little tiny isolated town, and there stands Henry Ford asking to meet her husband. Can he play for Ford? Ford hating jazz, which, of course, was going to send America into ruin. He loved folk music. He was enthralled with Jet Bisbee's playing on his fiddle, Thomas Edison equally so. Edison promptly offered Bisbee a contract recording in his New Jersey studios. Bisbee went and recorded his music. This was covered by all the major papers of the day. And suddenly this little old man, this very traditional American musician, becomes in parts of the country a household name, so much so that when he died a decade later, the New York Times ran his obituary. And to the end of his life, he said that no one would have known me but for Mr. Ford and Mr. Edison. And I thought that was a great example of how during these trips out in the country away from the big cities, they really did touch the lives of ordinary Americans and change them in wonderful ways. Well, we want to listen to just a little bit of Jeb Bisbee's music so people can get a sense of what interested Ford and Edison. a little bit of Jeff Bisbee's music. Uh, would a lot of Americans be listening to music of this type in this era? Very much so. Edison, of course, invented the phonograph back in the 1870s, which first brought music into American homes. And so Edison was looked to as one of those people, if he's recording you, you must be someone special. With jazz, which was considered a sort of heavy metal music of its era, starting to bother a lot of older Americans who thought it was sinful and leading young people into criminality and non-virtue, uh, going back, hearkening to old American folk tunes, which, of course, were based on foreign folk tunes, but we didn't think about that as much. 
it simply was refreshing. It was something different. It was endorsed by Edison, and, and so people listened. What are the parallels between the time period that you're writing about, which is 1914 to 1924, America in that age, and any parallels of the time that we're going through? That was what astonished me most when I was writing the book. The more books I write about history, the more I see it's cyclical. We really don't learn from things in the past. America, 1914 to 1924, is an America in transition. It's in transition because of invention, because of technology. Things people never would have thought of 20, 30 years earlier were now part of everyday lives. Modern times, let's think about the cell phone. It was something very few people had a phone they carried around, and all of a sudden it seemed as though everyone did. In America, 1914, for the first time, cars are becoming something that are part of your life if you're an ordinary American. Henry Ford's introduced the Model T in 1908. It's the first affordable car for the working class, so people can get in a car and go places, even if they're only of ordinary means. Because of Edison, with electric light, electric power, you can read if you want to late into the night instead of a candle making your eyes tired. Edison, with the kinetoscope flexible film, has moved movie theaters really into creation because for the first time a lot of people can sit in a darkened room and watch something on a screen. So young people can go to movies now. They can listen to music. They can dance in ways they hadn't before. But at the same time, you have older folks saying, wait a minute, this is getting away from the way America's supposed to be. And one of the reasons Henry Ford becomes so popular is because he seems to represent to the people who don't want America to change the way things have always been and should be, a good, sturdy, conservative, Protestant place where, yes, there's all these inventions, but you don't let them take over your lives and dominate. How often did you see parallels between Henry Ford and Donald Trump? I couldn't stop. It sh I guess the first moment was this. Henry Ford thought about running for president in 1916, came very close because he was a pacifist, didn't want America going into World War I, chose not to run because Wilson kept us out of war, became a Wilson supporter because of the League of Nations afterward, doesn't think about running in 1920, but 1923, 1924, he's a very viable candidate. And in a New York Times dissection of what the coming race may mean, they point out President Harding has died. There's a vice president, now president, most people don't know anything about. Henry Ford would have the support, it was believed, of voters in middle America. He's maligned in newspapers and all the main media on the coasts constantly. He's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a bumbler. He said himself he wanted to become president so he could throw a wrench in it. He didn't have any particular ideas besides the fact telling everyone they're all crooks and idiots. We need a businessman to go in. And the thought was if Henry Ford got his party's nomination, either one, he'd probably lose the popular vote because the coasts were the most populated. But because he'd dominate middle America, the western states, and much of the south, he would probably win in the electoral college and become president. It was that close. Henry Ford could have become president, and I promise you, the things we're seeing now, a lot of the same things would have happened then. You uh, write that he was disdainful of people who read books. Oh, very, very much. He didn't like books because he said that kept people from doing things, that they didn't think. He didn't like people who wrote books. He didn't like the media. Uh, he sued the Chicago Tribune at one point for a million dollars for character defamation. And when reporters would come out to cover the vagabond's trips, he'd lecture them that they had to tell the right news, the right stories that presented America the way it should be. Uh, he certainly would have been uh, hollering about fake news as loud or louder than our, the current incumbent, and he attracted the same kind of following. 
I want to spend a little bit more time with the, your two major protagonists so we understand because they are the vehicle, if you'll pardon my pun, for telling this story. Uh, we have a video that we found in the Ford archives. Yes. And uh, we should talk about the Ford archives because they're extensive. They're amazing. Yeah. Did, was this something that Henry Ford himself started to preserve his legacy and the company's legacy, or was it a later on addition? Henry Ford always understood the value of publicity. And a lot of the vagabond's trips, besides the idea of some friends getting out and having fun, was that you get your names in the newspaper every day. Your products are obviously going to benefit. And so he would hire cinematographers to come along on these trips and make the film available for newsreels to be shown in movie theaters. Uh, he wanted America to see how much fun you could have traveling in a car, and at the same time, if the name's Ford and Edison made you go buy something, even better. So this is a film that the company produced in the 1950s to tell its mm -hmm. story. Let's watch a little bit of it. began coming off the assembly line at the rate of one every 40 seconds. And what Henry Ford had foreseen happened. Mass production and the assembly line drove the price of the Model T down from $850 to $300. Now everybody could have one. So some statistics to understand the magnitude of this cheap production of cars. What are some of the things that you found out about America before the Model T and after? 1900, when there's no Model T yet, just heavy, expensive cars only the rich can afford, 8,000 passenger cars in all of America. 1908, Henry Ford introduces the Model T. In 1910, there are now half a million cars on the roads, half of those Model Ts. By 1920, there are 8 million passenger cars in America, 4 million Model Ts, and over half the people who own cars now use them for leisure travel besides going to and from work. It happened that quickly. It would not have happened without Henry Ford. The assembly line, turning out cars in 40 seconds, was the work of a mastermind. It took about two hours per car for his competitors. And you know the joke, you could only get Model T in black? There was a reason for that. Ford insisted on black paint because it dried faster. That meant you saved a few cents on every car going through the line. He passed it on to the consumer. He was also responsible for where steering wheels are today, I found out. He was a visionary. Uh, there's a lot of things about Henry Ford that are not admirable. But if you get in an American car today, the steering wheel's on the left side because Ford was the first one to perceive that the people in cars, the passengers, were going to change. They were the property of men only for a long time because it was so hard to drive and the roads were so rough. But Ford saw that more women were going to be in cars. Of course, the men would still drive because that's the role of men. You, you take control. But the ladies in their nice dresses would be seated nearby, and roads were still dirt and mud and everything else. With Americans driving on the right-hand side of the road, if the steering wheel was on the left, Ford believed, that meant you could pull up to the curb and the ladies could step out on the sidewalk and not get their shoes and clothes dirty. And it seems like a very sexist thing, and of course it is. But it still is the reason to this day that the steering wheel's on the left-hand side. Before that, it could be wherever the manufacturer put it, more often on the right than the left. Just to understand how profound the change was in society, you write in the book that prior to the introduction of the automobile, most Americans never ventured more than 12 miles from their home. Uh, that, that was a shocking statistic to me. I mean, uh, logical when you think about it, but shocking how closed and small people's worlds were. Very much so. And the whole idea of driving anywhere up until cars became popular, thanks to Ford, was difficult because 90% of American roads were referred to as wish-to-God roads, as in drivers would wish to God they could drive over something besides dirt, stone, and mud. Tires blew out every hundred yards or so and, and were hard to repair. Rocks tore up cars, and they were so expensive to repair. 
Ford built his Model T's out of vanadium steel, a much lighter metal. The Model T weighed 1,200 pounds compared to twice that much for competitors' cars. That meant even when the road was rough, the Model T rode higher and lighter and could go farther over roads. So yes, for the first time you could get in a car, you could go 100 miles to visit Grandma for Sunday dinner, and you didn't have to worry as much about having to change the tires eight times and getting hundreds of dollars worth of repairs on the car afterward. Twelve miles had been the limit people would travel because that's how far a horse and wagon could go comfortably and back in one day. Henry Ford also gave us distance. How frequently would people have taken ta trained trips before the car? When they took the train, that was how they traveled. There were two problems with that. The first, of course, are the rails themselves. You would go where the trains wanted you to go, and the second was the schedule. The third was the fact it cost a couple dollars to take the train somewhere. If you had a car, which you purchased for a few hundred dollars, thanks to Henry Ford, put in a couple gallons of gasoline, 20, 22 cents a gallon, boy, don't we wish those days were back, you could actually go on a trip and you could do it economically and you could go where you wanted at whatever time you wanted to leave. That wasn't possible with trains. You now had flexibility and economy. I'd like people to hear Henry Ford. This uh, piece of film is outside the window of your story. It's from 1932. It's giving advice to young men just so we can see and hear what the man sounded like. Let's watch. I support his carrying a greater burden than Abraham Lincoln carried. And he didn't show results. It is only common sense to let him finish his job. I think of him as a human-hearted, honest-minded, hard-working Hoover. So you write that at the time, uh, at the turn, the turn of the century in these first couple decades, he was the most famous man in America. Very much so. We have to remember there weren't a whole lot of famous people in America. This is before radio, before movies, certainly before television. Mostly American heroes had been military leaders and politicians. With the advent not just of newspapers but news wires so that something could happen in a part of America one day and be in newspapers and other parts of America the next, we started to see a few more people emerge, a couple entertainers, Mark Twain, the author, and so forth. But when Thomas Edison brings music into the home, when he brings films that much closer to large audiences seeing them, when he, in, he comes up with the incandescent bulb so your house and your business have electric light. Edison became the most famous man in America. Everyone knew his name thanks to newsreels, thanks to the newspapers. Everyone knew his face. Henry Ford, not only because of the Model T, but the $5 workday in 1914 when he doubled the salary of his employees and pretty much forced competitors to have to raise the salaries of the people they employed, he brought more money into the pockets of working Americans with his car, with Edison, with the things he had done. There were things you could do with that money. You could get out of your house and have some fun in ways that were unimaginable a generation earlier. They were the two celebrities. They were the Kardashians of their day. Uh, they might, if they, we had the same media of that time, someone would have given them a funny name. They would have been Fordison or something of that nature. Literally every American knew who they were and was fascinated by whatever they did or said. They were both complex personalities, as you describe them. One aspect of it, which you talk about in your book in, in pretty good detail, is Henry Ford's anti-Semitism. Were you surprised by that with your research? We all hear things about Henry Ford, uh, if we study history at all. The extent of his anti-Semitism came as a shock to me. The way he used a newspaper that he had purchased, the Dearborn Independent, uh, and almost exclusively for several years, used it to try to publicize what he claimed was a Jew plot to take over in the American economy, cause war, all kinds of things, dominate business, Wall Street, the works. It was terrible then. It was unforgivable then as it's unforgivable now. In the context of the time, 
Remember, Ford's out of the Midwest, the son of a farmer. And in the Midwest in the late 1800s when he's growing up, in the early 1900s, anything that's not white and Protestant is looked on with suspicion. Catholics were considered exotic. Ford was speaking to prejudice that he felt was widespread around the country, that there were going to be enough people who felt like he did that they would support whatever he was saying. The things he said seem awful now. They were awful then, but he was speaking to a prejudice that was widespread and existed at the time. This was also the time of Jim Crow laws and, and a really terrible story of race relations in this period in American history. Uh, did Henry Ford or Thomas Edison ever hire African Americans? Ford definitely. Ford was ahead of his time in hiring African Americans, and not only that, some of them achieved management positions. I don't believe he felt that black Americans as a rule were the equal of white Americans, but he also believed in workers and quality of work and giving people a chance to come up the ladder as long as they weren't Jewish. And yet he contradicted himself in this, in that he was suspicious and loathed Jews as a group, but there would be individual members of the Jewish faith that he would respect and think of his friends. He couldn't understand why they would be upset with him when his newspaper starts publishing all these outrageous claims. Edison also was, in a certain sense, anti-Semitic. He wasn't as overt about it as Ford, but we see it in his private correspondence with Ford and some of his other letters to people on the subject. He was very much a racist in terms of African Americans. Some of the recordings of his company were based on racial prejudice. I mean, he had record, re records out there. He was selling Coon Ball. Uh, I believe there was a fight at, at, at a colored saloon, supposedly with the sounds of black men cursing each other and slashing away with razors. Prejudice has always been part of America, very regrettably. It was very commercial in their times. They, they were, in some, to some extent, bigoted themselves, and it's reflected in their work and words. Both men's legacies are well-preserved. We referenced earlier the Ford Company's uh, archives and uh, recreation in Dearborn of the lifestyle at the time, etc. Uh, anyone that's watching this can go online and find an extensive access to Ford, Henry Ford and Ford Motor Company, and also with Mr. Edison. How did the particular companies themselves deal with these less savory parts of their, their main characters? I would say that as I was researching the book, the Ford Motor Company was very helpful, though somewhat concerned that the book might just be about some of Ford's less attractive beliefs and qualities. But if you go to the Ford Museum in Dearborn, and you go to the Benson Ford Research Center there, they have right there for anyone to see who wants to every copy of the Dearborn Independent with all the very unfortunate things that are in it. Uh, their archives contain the materials that demonstrate just what an anti-Semite Henry Ford was. Uh, Thomas Edison Research Park in West Orange, New Jersey, the same thing. The archives of their lives that have been preserved for us are very objective, and you can find in them what you look for. When I'm writing a book, I'm not trying to say just one thing or the other. I'm trying to give balance and context, which I hope I did. So uh, a little bit more on, on Thomas Edison. Uh, what are the ages of the two men during the 10 years that you write about? Thomas Edison is about a decade and a half older than Henry Ford. And we have to remember their relationship began when Henry Ford is working for one of Thomas Edison's companies in Detroit as a young engineer who's got this great idea for a gasoline-powered car. And he worships Thomas Edison. He forces his way almost onto Edison at a company banquet to say, I've done this wonderful thing I want to tell you about. Edison, who's used to dealing with young whippersnappers who've got some great invention, said, oh, yes, young man, You've got it. That's the thing. Keep at it and completely forgot it. Ford decided that he had Edison's blessing 
with his project. Uh, some years later now, when Ford's introduced the Model T and is one of the most famous and wealthy Americans, he writes asking for an autographed picture of Edison. And Edison not only sends a picture, but says, you know, I'd really like to meet Mr. Ford. He seems interesting. He'd forgotten the whole thing. But when they met, it was an instant warm bond for this reason. They are now the two most famous men in America. They've accomplished so much, everyone knows their name. But no one else but the two of them can understand the pressure. Because once you produce a miracle for the public, then you're expected to keep on doing it. Whatever you did yesterday is never enough. There must be more. They understood that in each other. They could talk to each other. They could relate in a way that no other two people in the country or even the world could. And so they became fast, close friends, two men who did not trust most people and did not have many friends. Where did the idea spring up for the vagabonds and the road trips? (laughs) Almost by accident. In 1914, Thomas Edison and his wife, Mina, invited Henry and Clara Ford and John Burroughs, the naturalist, a close friend of Henry Ford, to come visit them at their estate in Fort Myers uh, during the winter, sometime in January. A lot of wealthy Americans would go south, but Fort Myers was a wild place, really. It wasn't the more sophisticated east coast of Florida. And Burroughs, being a naturalist, Ford loved ornithology, and Edison always wanted to learn more things. The idea came that they'd go ahead and take a little car trip into the Everglades. I mean, there'd be lots of exotic plants and animal life, and it would be an adventure. It was pointed out to them that there's not really any roads there, and it's dangerous, and there's alligators and worse, and people could die, but oh, they knew better. Uh, the trip lasted a, a day and a half. There was a monsoon. Uh, there were snakes. There were alligators. They, they fled, but they liked the idea. And so it came about that they would take a trip once a year if they could, but uh, with a little better planning so disaster would be less looming. I want to spend a minute with the inclusion of Burroughs, and then there was a fourth character with a very famous last name, a Firestone. But uh, with with Burroughs, the naturalist, he was very well known to Americans in our presidential history study here, has famous pictures of him with Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Why was he a welcome part of this very wealthy couple and and their families? John Burroughs was one of the more famous naturalists in America. He had this long white Santa beard. He looked unique. And he was a crusty old coot, uh, where everyone else would talk about Mother Nature, kind of like a Disney film. Uh, Burroughs talked about nature being competition and, you know, only the strongest survive. But he loved to ramble and write about things. Theodore Roosevelt was his first famous sort of supporter, and he took a a trip with Roosevelt to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, Henry Ford had read Burroughs' writings. He didn't like to read much, but he liked John Burroughs. And and so uh, when Burroughs began speaking out against the Model T, demon on wheels, soon it's going to pollute every quiet corner of the forest. Uh, he sent Burroughs a Model T and said, try it, I, I bet you'll like it. Uh, Burroughs' attempt at driving did not work well. There was an unfortunate instance with a barn and the car colliding. But Burroughs and Ford became friends, and, and Burroughs appreciated Ford's real interest in nature. He also appreciated the fact that Ford purchased outright uh, Burroughs' farm birthplace that was in danger of being taken by the banks, So for Burroughs, it's great publicity, being a friend of Henry Ford for his own writing. And besides that, he just liked him. The fourth was Harvey Firestone. We certainly all know his name from tires, which are widely available even today. Uh, It would be logical that he would be a business partner. How did he become a friend and included in that group? Henry Ford had very few friends. But if he liked you, particularly if he thought you kept your word and you had a lot of common sense, then he would accept you. Harvey Firestone was a young man who'd started out peddling snake oil and from there carriage wheels and he got the idea that there should be tires for cars would be the next big thing but not tires that blew up all the time. 
he developed a kind of tire that was narrower and firmer than the old-fashioned tires, didn't explode as much. He needed to find some big manufacturer who would use those tires to bring them out into the, into the minds of consumers. Uh, he talked Ford into trying Firestone tires, and Ford, who very much hated planned obsolescence, he thought it was the duty of the manufacturer to give the consumer something not only dependable but that would last a long time, was impressed with Firestone tires. He bought 2,000 originally. He got them for the price that had been promised. They delivered the quality he had been promised, and so he started using Firestone tires on his cars. Clearly, that meant Harvey Firestone went from nowhere to being one of the tire magnets of the industry. So it would have served Firestone well anyway to be friends with Henry Ford. But one of the things I really like about Firestone is here you have a man who's done so much on his own. Now he's going out as part of the vagabonds with Ford and Edison who treat him like a punky kid brother and he has to run the errands and he has to do all the things. And he's happy to do it, not just because he owes so much to Ford, but because he really respects them and he enjoys being around them and listening to them. Of, of the four travelers and the vagabonds, I think most of us would like to go on a trip with Harvey Firestone. The first vagabond of Fort Myers adventure was 1914? Right. So when, what were the years of the ensuing vagabond trips? Uh, it picks up in 1915 out in California when part of a trip is made from Los Angeles to San Diego by car. And from there, 1916 on, except with one interruption in 1917 for the war, and then there's another interruption in 1922 because of, of certain economic financial problems going on. They kept doing these trips through 1924. They stopped after 1924, according to them, because too many people were crowding around them and there was too much attention paid and they couldn't relax. The opposite was true. So uh, in 1915, there was one sentence in your book that struck me. Despite the European War, 1915 remained a time of wonder in the United States. Why? Let's think about it for a minute. In 1915, yes, all these terrible things are happening overseas. But for the first time, technologically, industrially, America is the shining light in the world. Thanks to the $5 day introduced by Ford. I mean, it's not just because of Ford and Edison, but you've got the telephone with Alexander Graham Bell. You've got these other things. For the first time, Americans don't have to basically think, go to work, make a subsistence living, come home to candlelight, and basically when it gets dark, you go to bed. In work, in leisure, in all the amenities that suddenly were there, it's such a huge change in one generation. The parents of working class Americans in 1915 would never have imagined these wonders could be possible. And all of a sudden, life has changed, and leisure and the extra things you can do become just about as important as the work you do to support yourself. It was an entirely different culture, and it happened in a generation. We have um, some video that should, to show what these trips were like. They uh, <laughs> Today, though, I think the word is glamping. Yep. Uh, and uh, it was really not four men roughing it, but a large entourage. Let's show a little bit of, of, of what this tr these trips actually look like and um, what their times of camping on the road were got photographs and video of uh, these folks with cooks. Um, oh, yeah. uh, how many people would go on them? You might have as many as, as 20 staff members coming along. The idea was that they wanted to go out and have fun. They wanted to demonstrate, hey, guess what? You'd get in your car and go do these things too. But they weren't going to have to try to light their own campfires. They weren't going to eat cold beans out of cans. You know, they weren't just going to put a blanket on the ground. Uh, they had all these different amenities. Uh, they had a refrigerated car powered by Edison batteries so they could have fresh dairy. They had chefs who would prepare gourmet meals at night. In the morning, they would dress in freshly ironed clothes. But you see, they were so famous, and America was so grateful to them that that didn't matter. The point was 
hey, we're out in cars traveling and seeing these things. You can do it too. And they didn't go to big cities. They went out into the boonies where a lot of people hadn't even seen a car. So for ordinary Americans, they're saying, you know, we're not exactly like you are, but the basic parts of this are the same. Try it for yourselves. How did ordinary Americans follow their exploits? They followed them through the newspapers, and I promise you, you look back, every newspaper in America every day on these trips would have reports on where they were, what the camp looked like. If they stopped to eat at a cafe, what did they have for lunch? Now, for the big media, and by that we mean big city newspapers in those days, they regularly mocked Ford for his political beliefs and some of the really crazy things he had to say about history and so forth. He got so much wrong. At the same time, while they're convincing their readers editorially, this guy's a nut. He's really not worth your attention. Don't listen to him. Working class Americans loved him so much that the papers had no choice. They had to constantly write about him because that's why people would get subscriptions. What's Henry Ford up to today? If you worship Henry Ford and you think the big cities are suspicious anyway, you don't care what the New York Times says in an editorial or the Chicago Tribune, but when your local paper carries a New York Times wire service story about where the vagabonds camped last night and this wonderful thing that happened that was amazing that you just have to read about, they had to run those stories too. The media, the big media, in many ways looked down on them, but had no choice. They still had to cover them. Here's another bit of film, and this one is the combination of uh, Henry Ford and naturalist Burroughs, uh, and, and it looks like they were having a tree chopping contest. <laughs> we can, you can talk over this because it's silent, of course. Oh, this is famous. This is 1920. John Burroughs was very sick. Uh, there were There was a business slump, so the vagabonds weren't going to go out on a trip at all, but then they decided we needed to to show we have faith in the business community. So they actually went to uh, Yama Farms in upstate New York, a, a sort of spectacular place only rich people went. This is the only time they did that. But they needed to get attention. Something newsworthy had to happen so the newspapers would cover it. Burroughs, 80 years old supposedly is challenged by Henry Ford to a tree chopping contest with Thomas Edison as the timekeeper. And so, as you can see, the, the press, well, we have to see what happens here. And it was a fix. Uh, Burroughs has this little slender tree. He can whack with an axe twice and it'll fall over. Ford takes on a much thicker tree. Burroughs wins. But the main thing is everyone in America reads about how battling Burroughs bested Henry Ford. They were masters of publicity. In your notes of uh, Mr. Barrows, you write, he was a world-class griper, and he whined <laughs> about everything. Why did they continue to include him? <laughs> well, you know, we all have that grumpy old grandpa or uncle. It's part of the family. And you just kind of accept the fact that, that he's going to be complaining about everything. Ford and Edison admired expertise in others. And Burroughs was a fabulous naturalist. And on these trips, they would learn things from him. Besides that, he became part of their image. I mean, there were vaudeville jokes about, you know, people stumbling upon these four men, and you claim you're Henry Ford, and you claim you're Thomas Edison, you claim you're Harvey Firestone, I suppose the old guy with the white beard, Santa Claus. Burroughs was part of the group. They accepted him warts and all, and sometime there were plenty of warts, which are a lot of fun to read about these days. You go through the Vagabond's trips chronologically, and uh, the, by 1916, you mentioned earlier that, for, that Henry Ford was contemplating his first of two possible runs for the presidency, mm -hmm. and in between there was an exploration of a Senate bid. Almost got there. Talk about his politics. Where would you put him today on the liberal to conservative, Democrat to Republican scale? If, if Henry Ford were alive today and active in politics, uh, he would be on Fox and Friends every other week. He, he would certainly uh, support the most conservative uh, political spokespeople. 
he would believe greatly in conspiracies. He would buy into that, that the government basically exists to dupe the taxpayer and take advantage of honest people. Oddly enough, he would not consider himself a bigot or a racist or anything else. He would think he was just a good common sense man who was brave enough to say what he thought. But let's please remember, his whole political philosophy was fine. If I'm president, I'm going to throw a wrench in it. He had no programs to offer that might change things in any way. He was appealing in the broadest sense to other people who were as alienated as he was. Did he align with one party or the other? He didn't align with either party because he felt he was above that. When he ran for the Senate, which was his only official race getting his name on the ballot in Michigan, he ran on both the Democratic and the Republican tickets. He happened to win on the Democratic ticket. He was nipped on the Republican ticket by a, a former businessman in uh, administration official who was very much against the $5 workday and, and socialism. But uh, in his heart, he was really a Republican, and he was a, a very right-wing Republican. He was a pacifist, but I think we'll remember certain uh, elected officials today who were very much against America getting involved in the Middle East and in Iraq. You know, that's ridiculous, we can't do that, and then you get into office, you think differently. But well, we can assume if Henry Ford had been elected president, uh, the chaos he promised would have ensued. Would you talk about uh, how he promoted his anti-war views in the years running up to America's decision to enter World War I? He was very outspoken. Uh, prior to America getting into World War I, preparedness was, some, was a, a popular word, that we have to be ready in case we have to go to war. Thomas Edison very much supported preparedness. Ford said he would spend a million dollars if he had to to keep America out of wars, that America didn't want it, the business people needed it for their products, the politicians wanted it. And in 1915, he decided that he would rent a steamship and he would invite on this steamship all the best minds in America, political leaders, religious leaders, business leaders, to get on the peace ship, as it was called. They would go over to Scandinavia to a neutral country, and there they would invite the heads of the warring powers in Europe to come together, and they would convince them that fighting is not the way to resolve your problems. We'll talk through it. So the peace ship got a lot of publicity, much of it on the eastern seaboard newspapers mocking a Ford, which he didn't like. What he couldn't believe is America's leading lights didn't want to get on this. They thought it was a terrible idea. Edison turned him down. Burroughs turned him down. And he ends up on this ship with a lot of people who don't uh, have much heft in terms of being able to make things happen, but loudly expressed opinions. And the peace ship is a disaster. By the second day, the reporters who are on board are writing about all the chaos and confusion. Ford says he has a cold and closes himself in his stateroom. And as soon as the peace ship lands on the other side of the Atlantic, Ford heads home claiming illness. Uh, it was an embarrassing thing for Henry Ford, but he finally decided it was worth the half million dollars it cost him because at least it got people talking about the senselessness of war. I'll say this. He put his money where his mouth was, and his mouth was everywhere. <laughs> but you write that once America decided to get into the war, uh, that, in fact, he was all in, and he turned his factories into war production. How did he square that intellectually, or was it purely an economic decision? Ford was a patriotic American. He did love this country. Once we were in the war... He decided that the only thing to do was to try to support your country as best you could. But he promised that he would not profit a cent. At the, whenever the war was over, they'd figure out, okay, how much did the United States government spend for war materials produced from my factory? Calculate what his profit had been from that, and he would return the money. And when the war was over, uh, someone you know, probably from the U.S. Treasury, very helpfully figured it out for him that he had made about $900,000 profit. He never gave that back to the government. 
somehow that never came to light in any way that uh, would have been a public scandal. But I think that was Ford's way of saying, you know what? You screwed up. I made some money. Okay. You referenced this earlier um, about how he uh, really disavowed and was angry about fake news coverage of him oh, on the road. Oh, yeah. One of his uh, ways to combat this was the purchase of the Dearborn Independent. Will you tell me that story? The Dearborn Independent was, was a very nondescript weekly newspaper, you know, in Ford's hometown. Ford, of course, fake news. He didn't like the press. He wanted his own newspaper. And so he purchased it for very little money. I mean, let's face it, who, who wanted to own the Dearborn Independent except Henry Ford? But he tried to turn it into a tool for his own political views, and he hired a lot of experienced journalists, and he sunk a lot of money into it. Uh, he had a column, Mr. Ford's Views, in it that was ghostwritten. But remember, his audience is middle America working class folks, and if it said Mr. Ford's Views, they're going to assume Henry Ford wrote it. Problem was... Uh, the paper didn't, as he had expected, become a rival of the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune and all the big newspapers. Most of the people who had it got it because subscriptions were built into the price of a Model T. Ford basically made it clear to the people who were getting good salaries to work for the Independent, well, what are you going to do to make sure people read this? And one of them said, sensationalism. Let's have some sensationalism. So what was there? Ford is anti-Semitic. He's quickly talked into the fact that we can reveal all the plots the Jews have going, much of it based on uh, uh, sorry. He, Ford bought in to legends that the Jews were trying to take over the world economy and everything else. And for 91 straight weeks, his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, ran supposed exposés. We have an example of one of those I think we can put on screen. So if 91 weeks, the, the Dearborn Independent had these major headlines mm -hmm. exposing what he saw as the... The problem, the international Jew. And uh, how, did, how did people react to this? Did his own editorial staff continue to support and There were a this? few people working on staff who quit, but it was simply understood this is what Mr. Ford wants us writing about. If you're here, you accept that, and they did, and they kept doing it. Executives in the Ford Motor Company tried to convince him that you're making a terrible mistake if only because Jewish people buy cars and they could start boycotting the Model T. Ford's response was, if it's a good enough product, people are going to buy it no matter what. He only ordered the Independent to stop running these weekly articles when he's preparing himself, positioning himself to run for president in 1924, and he calls him off. When he ends up not running for president, the, the articles start again. And he only eventually stops doing it when a lawsuit is brought against him. He loses the suit, not only loses money, but has to publicly in some way apologize. His apology is that he had no idea that these things were being written. That simply wasn't true. When he was considering running for president, there was an incumbent Republican president. Uh, he managed to convince President Harding to come visit the Vagabonds on one of their trips. We have, once again, some film from uh, the, that experience. Uh, tell me the story of how the president came, how long he stayed, and what, uh, what the reaction was. In 1921, Warren G. Harding had yet to accomplish really anything in office. Uh, historians will say later that he was elected president because he looked like one. He ran on a platform of American first, we will only think of America, that is true patriotism. And he was invited, he and his wife, to join the Vagabonds for a week or more out on the road in a camp in Maryland. He, Harding came, but he outfoxed the Vagabonds. They expected they were going to have a lot of time to talk to him about their concerns. Edison wanted to talk to him about American rubber production. Ford wanted to uh, purchase Muscle Shoals, some, some government-owned properties in Alabama. 
never had a chance. Harding, who understood the newspaper business better than anyone because he owned a newspaper back in Ohio, dominated the proceedings, ended up only staying an afternoon and part of a morning, got all the headlines, and the vagabonds were left sort of going, what hit us? I think it was partly because of his exposure to Harding and getting an idea that, hey, wait a minute, you know, he doesn't seem that smart to me, that, that Ford thought he saw an opening. And of course, scandals involving the Harding administration began to break in 1922 and 1923. And so Henry Ford pretty much positioned himself to go for the Republican nomination against an incumbent president again with his strength in middle America with the scandals of Harding. Then Harding, once again, doing something inconvenient for Henry Ford, died. And we had a new president, Calvin Coolidge, uh, which you say then put to bed his thoughts of running for the presidency. Ford still considered running against Coolidge, but a couple things happened. The first was that Mrs. Ford... Clara Ford did not want her husband to run, and and he listened to her. And the second thing was he really wanted Muscle Shoals in Alabama. He wanted for the hydroelectric power he could bring to the farmers in that part of America. Uh, He said that he was doing this altruistically. It's also true the government had spent almost $80 million building the facilities, and he offered $5 million to purchase it, plus a lease of about a million a year. If he ran for president and was voted in, that would be a conflict of interest. He couldn't do it anymore. So it seems, based on available evidence, that he cut a deal with Coolidge. He would support Coolidge, and Coolidge, in turn, would not speak against the Muscle Muscle Shoals purchase uh, by Henry Ford. Uh, Ford was not politically sophisticated enough to notice the language there. He would come out and endorse Coolidge. Coolidge would not oppose selling Muscle Shoals to Henry Ford. Any politician who had any experience would have told Ford, wait a minute, fella, think about it. The vagabonds made their way to Calvin Coolidge's home in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. What was that trip all about? Oh, it was it was just an amazing thing. Uh, they would go on their trip to visit Coolidge in his summer home. They would endorse him. In turn, Ford very much expected that Coolidge would speak out in favor of the Muscle Shoals sale to Henry Ford. To Ford and to Edison, and to a lesser extent to Firestone, Burroughs had passed away by then. This was equals meeting in some sort of great convocation, and they'd get together and tell stories. Vagabonds probably would be invited to stay overnight or something. To Coolidge, it was taking an hour out of his schedule to get the endorsement of some prominent people. And the vagabonds were shocked after an hour that Mr. and Mrs. Coolidge started saying goodbye to them, and they were sort of escorted out. Uh, It was just a shock to them, and and they had no idea. But once again, they'd been outmaneuvered by the president. We have just about five minutes left in our conversation. So how did the vagabond trips end? When Burroughs died, part of the joy went out, because now you don't have someone who can point out and teach you about nature. But you still had the other three. Uh, 1921, Harding was a disappointment to them because Harding hogged the headlines. 1922, there was no trip. 1923 was supposedly to launch uh, Ford's presidential campaign. Instead, it was him saying he wasn't going to run, he'd support Coolidge. So 1924, they're nipped in the bud by Coolidge, so to speak. And then they said, okay, there's too much attention. We won't go anymore. But it was different. They, they stopped because they weren't going to get daily attention anymore. There are now 20 million cars in America, an estimate that 10 million Americans every summer go out on trips. Radio is coming into view. Suddenly there's so many more American heroes in sports. The movies are, are bringing us cinematic idols to worship. There's lots of other famous people for the newspaper to write about. They weren't going to get the attention anymore, so the trips dwindled out. A couple years later, when Ford tried to revive them, Edison didn't want to go anymore. You uh, went on all the Vagabonds trips. Yep. 
How many years did this take you? Uh, about two and a half. And how many miles did you travel? I put just over 32,000 miles on the car. I tried to go on the roads they used where they still existed when they didn't exist. I would try to use whatever roads were closest to them. And I got most of my material from small county uh, historical societies that still had eyewitness accounts of what happened when these famous folks appeared. Plus the Ford Museum in Dearborn and the Edison Research Park in New Jersey wonderfully helpful. Anyone who's interested in the book or these trips, you can actually go on the trips yourself, and it's fascinating. So in the end, uh, w after having worked on this book and told us this story, uh, what do you think the lessons are? Is it a capsule piece of American history, or are there lessons for today that we can take away? The thing it will remind us is over and over, history is cyclical. It really is true. If we don't learn from it, we repeat it. The exact political situation we have today is reflected in Henry Ford and his presidential ambitions and the things he wanted to do. Immigration was a huge touching point politically in America at the time. Uh, do we want these Mexicans and these Latins coming into this country? What should we do if we don't want them? Uh, there was a wall built along the U.S.-Mexican border at the time. People forget to mention that today. But it didn't work, and it crumbled into ruins, and you can still see part of it today if you want to. We had accusations of fake news, and the media being accused of just deliberately being against someone in certain political philosophies. You read this book, you learn a lot about America then, but there's also a great deal about America now. You have written most of your last books looking at characters that tell us about a period of time. So have you gotten, first of all, which is first, the chicken and, uh, and the egg, the idea of the time period or the personalities, and do you have a next one in mind? I always try to find some era in American history I want to understand better and then find iconic individual or events, individuals or events that symbolize that. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of researching a book about the real history of the U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, let's face it, it's being talked about all the time, and yet everything happening today has happened in the past, up to and including camps that some people describe as concentration camps, and others as their pleasant facilities and we're treating everybody fairly. We've got to start learning from the things that have happened, because there are lessons there. History is important, and this book I'm writing right now like the rest of my books, I just hope people will go, wait a minute, where is this happening today? This is book number 32. When you can't write good, write a lot has <laughs> always been my philosophy. And Jeff Quinn, and the name of the current book is The Vagabonds. Thank you very much for telling some of its story to us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcast at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.